2 Samuel chapter 11. You may be seated. When I was preaching this morning, I got to a particular section in, in the message and I preached on fulfilling vision. And so just to summarize quickly or maybe not so quick, we'll see. I've been in a series on Sunday mornings on vision. Without vision, my people perish. You have to have vision. If you don't have vision, you're going to have a tendency to drop out of life. You say, well, I'm retired. Flush that. I don't even know where that came from. Can I say that, Pastor Christian? Flush that? Anyway, get rid, get rid of the, the mindset that you're just going to rest on your laurels and retire. You say, well, I worked hard enough. You never stop serving God. So that's what I mean by that. Okay, you retired from your municipality. You retired from the borough. You retired from your job. You sold your business, and now you're not going to work like you used to. But you never stop seeking God. You never stop serving God. You never stop praying. Come on. You know, one of the problems that's happened with pastors over the years is that they get tired and they take vacations. And in their vacations, they rest from prayer, they rest from pressing, they rest from preaching, and they're like, yeah, I, I do think there needs to, I'm, I'm not one that really believes in sabbaticals, so, you know, you, you get to talk to somebody else about a sabbatical, I, I'm just, maybe I'll change my mind 20 years from now, I, I don't know. I think you can go away and write a book, and I think there could be wonderful things. But there's something about staying on the cutting edge of faith that, that, that brings a refreshing to you. And so I was, I was preaching this morning about fulfilling vision. And in the course of the message, I got to the section on commitment. And it's about Elijah and Elisha and the mantle that's passed and how Elisha takes over and fulfills the dream, his vision of receiving the double-double. He, The double, it's not double-double, that would be like four times. The double, the double portion. Double-double would be like four times then, right? Okay, he didn't say that. He said that I want the, a double portion of your spirit, which is, as the prophet, the man of God, Elijah says, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I go, it'll be yours. And you see this commitment of, a, of a, a man, a young man. We don't know his age. They speculate on that. We see this commitment in that when the mantle is thrown on him, he, he, he has a barbecue. He torches all of the, starts a fire with all the farming implements. And they butcher 12 yoke of oxen, which is a lot of meat. I think the whole town came. He kissed his mom and dad and said, I'm, I'm off. And he goes into the service of Elijah the mighty man of God, the prophet of God, and he becomes the hand washer or the servant of Elijah. And it's, it's a picture of commitment. And as I was in the midst of preaching, the Lord quickened me to the reality that many people don't commit for a lifetime. And as a result of their lack of commitment, as a result of the lack of devotion, we have so many that have fallen there have been so many people who have traded in destiny for destruction, who've traded in for a few moments, destroying their whole family, destroying their children, and, you know, believing that, you know, things are changing and pray for healing and there's forgiveness. And yes, yes, and yes. But it doesn't have to go that way. I am not personally planning to ever fall. We're like, well, we all stumble. In yeah, okay, don't give me that nonsense. I understand that's true. I am planning. I am speaking. I am declaring that I will finish my race. I will press on. I will fulfill what God. Are you thinking that way? Are you planning that way? Do you teach your kids that way? Well, you know, not everybody. What are you talking about? Not everybody makes it. You speak that over your family if you want to. I don't speak that over my family. I don't know where I was. It was just, it just happened. Maybe it was Mr. Minister Barry. Or maybe it was, it was someone in here. <laughs> I remember being benched because of an attitude on a lacrosse team when I was in high school. I was a senior high, senior high school student. I was a lacrosse player. I was an attackman, for those of you who know what that is. And I also played def defense. And, and I was also a midi. Anyway... I started getting an attitude. And my coach was 
very, very tough. And I hated him and loved him all at the same time. You know, you never remember the teachers that let you get away with stuff and they were easy on you. You were like, what was their name? I don't know. You always remember the ones that, the, that wanted to get the best out of you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And so I had an attitude, and I'll never forget. We were moving towards the championship. He said, Bracken, you're benched. You're on the bench. I'm like, dude, you're, you're going to hurt the team. I wasn't the champion guy, but I was a key player. I'm thinking, that's a bad move, coach. He said, that's another reason why you're on the bench. And I, I just needed to, I needed to get on the pine, ride the pine. Can I tell you how much I hate being on the bench? I hated being on the bench. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Put me in. I want to play. And so I rode the bench. Man, it sure did something for me. As I rode the bench and was not in that week, I just had a miraculous intervention of my attitude. And I sat there and I, I watched the guy play my position and I, I had a bad attitude pretty much all the way through the game. Because I'm thinking the guy that's playing in my position, I'm way better than him and he, you know. And it was an important game and we happened to win, but it was really close and it was all of that. And I'm just thinking, man, what? Now, I didn't know the Lord back then, but he knew me. How many of you know what I mean by that? And I had a miraculous change in my attitude. It was something the coach said during the game. He said, you can ride next week too if you want. It's up to you. And so I just thought, no, no, we ain't riding next week. Let's eat dirt. Yes, let's eat dirt. Let's get in the game. Let's, let's plan to succeed. That whole next week, we had practice every day for three hours every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday was a little bit light. Saturday, we played big games. Sunday, we're off. That's how it was. Oh, Monday. Oh, Monday, when I'm sitting there in the locker room, lacing up my cleats. Oh, buddy, I'm going to be number one coming in on all the runs. I laced my cleats tight that day, and I thought, oh, you're going to get 110. It's 110% bracken. Here we go. I got out there. I pushed myself through all the laps. I pushed myself through all the, all, the, all the calisthenics. I pushed myself through all the drills. I was cheering people on. I was just going for it. Monday, but I didn't get back in the didn't, didn't get back on the on the lead you know the lead team. I didn't get become a starter on Monday, or Tuesday, or Wednesday. Had to push Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and there's something happening Thursday where I just I just decided you know what we gonna we gonna win. And if I'm not the best choice, and so be it. And I told Coach I was broke, and I just said, man, you you go, Coach. I'm sorry. He said that's good, Bracken. And I started that next game that Saturday. And I, and I had an amazing, an amazing time. And I learned that I don't like the bench. I don't like sitting out. Do you? I'm not the kind. And I believe that when God calls you and he calls me, when he calls us, he calls us to win. He doesn't call us to ride the bench. And if you've gotten used to losing, you need to just stick around. You need to stick around. I was putting my boots on tonight. And my wife said something like, you're a champion. I said, yeah. <laughs> and said, you know, your marriage is good when your wife calls you a champion. Come on, somebody say amen. And I said, you're a champion too. What's up? I love you. You're awesome. I have no plans of failing, no plans of riding a bench. I have every plan, every hope, every dream of fulfilling what God's called me to do. And yet, I was reminded that many people fail and fall. And uh, I don't want you to fail. God doesn't want you to fail. His plan, his intention for you is to, is to walk in victory. His plan, his intention for you is to be more than a conqueror. His plan, God's intention, his plan for you, for your marriage is to have a blessed marriage. Amen. To fall in love, to stay in love and really know what love is. For all of your babies to become princes and they are princes and they are, they are princesses. I still have in my phone, my daughter's number, my princess. When I call her, I said, Siri, who's a false prophet. So you gotta be careful. I say, Siri, call my princess. That's my daughter. I told my kids, you're royalty. You tell your kids they're royal. They're royalty. Tell them they're going to change the world. Speak life over them. 
position them, get them in places to walk in victory. I want to teach you for a moment tonight a message that I've preached here numerous times, but the Lord told me to preach it as I was preaching this morning. Because David, King David, was a man who was, he had everything. And he, he destroyed his life. And the effects of that, you see going down to the generations, even to the, to the effect of a whole nation. You say, how's that? Because of his lust and his sin problem, it was trans, transferred generational iniquity, generational sin to Solomon, who had a thousand wives. A thousand broke God's law, broke God's commandment. And as a result, the kingdom was divided. Yet not in his lifetime for the sake of David, his father, the Lord said, I won't do it in your lifetime, but I'm gonna do it after you. And literally what happens in time is that those 10 tribes are gone and, and the nation of Israel is scattered and it really started then. Are you all there in 2 Samuel chapter 11? King David falls by breaking what I would call hedges of protection. I, I've given you notes, and we've, we're calling it this time through, and I've preached it probably half a dozen times here. Grow some hedges. Everybody say, grow some hedges. What do you mean by that? Well, I, the, what I'm going to talk to you about is you need a hedge of protection. Come on, lift your hand and say, God, I need a hedge of protection. Okay, there's protection that comes simply by the blood of Jesus and, and, and such. And we can pray protection over people. It's wonderful to have Mayor Edna in the house. Mayor Edna needs more prayer. And, and God's healing you and touching. We're so grateful. Had a, had a little bit of a bump in the road, but glory to God. Amen. Amen. Be healed in Jesus' name. So thankful for you. Surely you too. Healed and old. No. Amen. All three of you in the name. All three of you crazy Holy Ghost people over here. Lord touched them, healed them. Thank you. Holy Ghost. Right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I commission you, if you're, been, if you're moved at all, even if you're not moved at all, I commission you to pray for Mayor Edna. She needs prayer every single day. She's carrying a vision. She's carrying a burden. She's carrying a call from God to do what God's called her to do in this borough. Thank God for Mayor Edna DeVries. Noel, thank you so much for serving and putting your name forward. We've been praying for you, and we, and we will every day. What are we talking about? Hedges. Now, I'm going to preach a message to you about four, growing four different hedges of protection in your life. They're not the kind that you can come and have someone lay hands on you, and then miraculous greenery is going to surround you, and then everything's going to be okay. These are the kind of hedges you need to grow. You need to grow these. They don't just happen. They happen by you intentionally on purpose saying, I'm putting protection here. I'm going to finish my race. I'm not going to be benched. I'm not going to fall. I'm going to finish. And if you think you can't fall, you already did. Anyone can be wiped out. And I could go ahead and give you statistics about pastors and leaders and how they destroy their lives. And I'm not going to do that. I think many of you know Lots of stories. And if we did a show of hands, which I'm also not going to do, you would see how many people have been destroyed by church splits, by pastors, leaders, people abusing, falling into sin. That's not going to happen here. Come on, someone say that's not going to happen here. Why not? Simply because we're gonna, we've grown some hedges and we're going to maintain them and we're going to finish our race. Can you say amen? All right. So David broke down these hedges of protection. And so ask yourself this question. Are you hedged about? Are you protected as a man of God, as a woman of God, as a student? All you students and all you kids, don't dismiss me because pastors, you're preaching this, you know, to the adults. Oh, no, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to every single person that would have ears to hear and a heart to respond. David broke these hedges. So let's look at this now. Four hedges every believer must grow. Four hedges every believer must grow. Let me see your notes, make sure I'm not messing this up. 
Yeah, I got it. Four hedges. And we do have notes for you. If you don't have those, go ahead and raise your hand and someone will bring that to you. Are you all there in 2 Samuel? Okay, go to chapter 11. Forgive me. Would you please stand? We're going to read the whole thing. Look, go chapter 11, verse 1, New International Version. Are you ready? Stand up on your feet in honor of the word of God. If you're not able to stand, we understand that. Pray for your healing or your attitude and ask that you would stand up on the inside. Second Samuel chapter 11. In the springtime, when the kings go to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem. What did he do? He remained at Jerusalem. Is he a king? Yes. But he didn't go to war. It's the first hedge he broke. One evening, imagine that. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw. He what? He saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. And she was purified from her uncleanness. And she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David and said, I am pregnant. So King David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So he sends for her husband. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was. And what a dirtbag. He's talking to the husband of the, he slept with his wife. She's pregnant and he knows it. And he's talking to her, talking to the husband how the soldiers were, how the war was going. He's making some small talk. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent to him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. Hmm. When David was told that Uriah did not go home, he asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in Upon the open fields. I can't take it. I'm like trying to read eight point font. Jesus, help me. Right Whoa. I'm so sorry. Woo. We can, I can see. Okay. Uh, what verse are we in? Oh, uh, can't even help with How can I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live. I will not do such a thing. And when David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. And the next day at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. Wow. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's servants and did not go home. He's got to be wondering like, what's going on? In the morning, David wrote letters to Joab and sent it with Uriah. So he carries, watch this, he's carrying this note. And in it, he wrote, put Uriah to the front line where he's fighting, is where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. He carries his own death sentence. King David, nice. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Move in power. Amen. You may be seated. The first hedge of protection, I'm telling you, I want you to finish. 
I don't only want you to finish, I want you to fulfill what God called you to do. And the enemy is an ugly, mean devil who comes to steal, as Pastor Vince said so eloquently, steal, kill, and destroy. So how are you going to finish your race? How are you sure that you're going to follow through and in the end hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Because if you think it's just going to happen, I got another, another news for you, news flash. It ain't just going to happen. And so the first hedge of protection that you need to build in your life, that you need to grow, you need to grow this hedge. Number one, it's a hedge of protection that comes by doing the will of God. It's the hedge that comes when you're walking in God's purpose, staying in the battle. If you're tired of fighting, you better just get to a prayer meeting and get untired. Because it's not over. It's not ever over until it is. When is it over? When it's over. I've been talking about how I'm going through school. I had an exam today. And uh, I was so tired from prepping and preaching and all of that and I go home, and I just feel this rush of God's strength. I'm like, whoo, this is it. This is it. I mean, like, uh, my flesh is going, lie down. But the Spirit's saying, take the test now. Do it now. And I'm going to tell you, the last thing I wanted to do was just go home and take an exam. It was like staying in the fight. I wanted a nap. Anybody take a nap on Sundays? Naps are ordained by the Lord. I'm convinced of it. No, Father, help him. Amen. So at home, I was, I mean, I was semi-rude to Daniel, I think. I mean, I was just like, whoa, let's go, let's go, let's go. I start reviewing some terms. I'm looking at Quizlet. How many of you know what that is? I'm going through, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to smoke this thing. I'm going to smoke this thing. Here we go, here we go. And I went down, and you got to do this lockdown browser, and you got to be in this room and show, show the, the professor the whole room, and then you got to sit down. And I took the test. I have no idea what I got, but it's a fight. The point is, it's a fight. And if you don't stay on the cutting edge of faith, go ahead and put that back up. That first point that I'm talking about right now. If you don't stay in the place of the battle, you don't, at the springtime when the kings go out to war, if you stay home when God's called you to go, you're in big trouble. And you need to be very careful. Look at, underline all the different places in the scripture where it says, David sent, David sent, David sent, David sent. When you begin to send people to do what God called you to do, you have a serious problem. I mean, where is the, where is the, the one thing that I seek after David? Where is the, behold the beauty of the Lord David? Where is he? He's not here. He checked out. And he destroyed the, the first hedge of protection that comes protection that comes to you when you stay in the battle, when you stay on the cutting edge of faith, there's a release of God's power. Oh, it's not always comfortable, but I got some more news for you. It's not about you being comfortable. It's about you fulfilling with the goal of God in your life. You say, man, you're kind of intense, pastor. Yeah, I'm, I'm sick of seeing pastors and leaders and people get wiped out. I'm not doing that. I'm not planning for that. I'm planning to overcome and raise up overcomers. I'm planning to take over with the, with the glory of God. Come on, somebody say we're taking over. When you advance God's kingdom, there is a fresh sharpness that comes about you. I've just did a number of conferences and very demanding uh, conferences. They're, they're, some conferences are not so demanding. They're just sort of enjoyable. You get to preach a couple times and eat great food and have fellowship. And other conferences are like, let's go. <laughs> Intense warfare. That's what this was. So we went to Branson and we went to Springfield. And you're on your feet ministering for 12 hours a day. And when you're done with that, then you hustle back and get your notes and you preach that night. And you're done with that, you get up and you preach in the morning. And then you minister all that day and hopefully you get a nap in a car driving back from Arkansas to go preach again. And it's just intense. But I will tell you what I love about it. It brings something. It brings something of sharpness to you. Some of you forgot what it is to be in a fight. Some of you forgot what it is to be on the championship team. I'm telling you, get off the bench. Get in the game. And there's a sharpness in doing it. Is it fun? I like the results. I don't always like it sometimes when I'm in the midst of it. But if you, what's the option? Stay home, shrink back, say no. What are you going to do? Say no? You, no? 
Well, if the Lord tells you to say no, say no. But many times God's wanting you to do things. You say, well, the spirit leads me. Yeah, the spirit's leading you, but your flesh is weak. You missed a great place to say, oh, oh me or oh my or something. There is protection that comes when you're on the cutting edge of doing what God called you to do, flowing in power in the house of God, doing what God called you to do in your purpose. That's the first thing. Some of you need to get back in the game, get back in the battle, get back in the battle. So I'm tired. I know. That's why you got to get prayer and you got to do number two, the hedge of protection that comes from fellowship and accountability. The hedge of protection that comes from fellowship and accountability. You see, where do you get that from? If you look at the text with me, please. So David stays back. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked. He would have, he would have been at the battle, but no, he, he's chilling. He's watching Netflix. And from the roof he saw. You know what's amazing? How many, how many times you'll see in Scripture the word saw. When Eve saw the fruit. When the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, they took them. Over and over and over you will see through Scripture the eye gate and that which you gaze at you'll become. When, when we behold the glory of God, we, we become more like him. When you see God, you become more like him. But if you start looking at something off the rooftop, I love what uh, the, our spiritual berserker, Pastor, uh, uh, thank you, Pastor Earl Thurner, he said in a men's meeting, he said in a men's meeting, men, listen to me. He was really, you think I'm intense. He's like twice, twice me, at least, at least. Still ministering, still flowing in the power of God. He says, man, if you look too long, you're on a hook real strong. <laughs> if that needs definition, then just ask your father. <laughs> He's there and he, he falls into this demonic trap. Now, I, I honestly, I think if you, if you see who her, the daughter is, is one of the leaders, I think actually had been fighting something all along. I think he had seen her before. I don't think he didn't know who it was. But you, look what he says. David sent messengers to go get her. Now, if, if Joab was there, if Joab was there, well, why isn't Joab there? Because he sent away all the people he's accountable to. He sent away. If you start getting isolated, Proverbs uh, uh, 11, I think it is. He who isolates, maybe it's 18. It's in there somewhere. It's in the Proverbs. He who isolates himself rages against all wisdom. When you begin to isolate yourself, you begin to draw back from fellowship. You begin to draw back from accountability. You begin to crawl fish away from people. Come on, all the Southern people said, you know that's right. You begin to shrink back from people. You're not open. You're not transparent. You're, you, you're not as, you're not as um, self-effacing. And you begin to get isolated. You're in trouble. David sent away his hedge of protection from relationship, accountability. He sent them away. Because if Joab was there, Joab was with him. Joab was with him in the wilderness. Joab was like his man. If his boys were there, they would have said, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uriah was one of his mighty men. Go study the text. This was like his bro. Yeah. This was his brother. This is not, you know, he become this king and he's just, Ooh. he gets filled with lust. And if it was Joab that was there, he would have said, David, have you lost your ever loving mind? Shut up. And for whatever reason, he sent them away. And they, I think they should have said something that he was staying home. Yeah. Some of you need to get plugged in and involved. You're not. And you think it's okay. It really isn't. Because the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. said, I just don't want to do this at my time in my life. Well, as long as you're obeying God, I think that's great. But if you're not, and you make excuses for not being accountable, I don't like people. They hurt me. Yeah, people hurt you. What are you going to do? Live under your kitchen table the rest of your life? What are you going to do? Pull the covers over your head? 
I don't want to get hurt anymore. Get healed. Forgive them. Some of you used to break the alabaster box all the time. You don't break it anymore. You can become a Judas yourself. David sent away all the people that would tell him to shut up. And I say it this way. And I, somebody said, Pastor, shut up. So I teach my kids not to say that. Okay, sorry. David sent away everyone that would tell him to be quiet. <laughs> Who is it in your life that you're accountable to, that you have fellowship with, that knows your weaknesses, knows your strengths, and would, can tell you to sit down and be quiet? I don't care what... I don't care what station of life. I don't care if you're the CEO. Right. Doesn't, matter who you, doesn't matter who you are. I don't, I don't care if you're the king. Right. Who has your shut-up card? Who has your shut-up card? Who can tell you honestly, they're not afraid of hurting your feelings. They love you. They don't hurt your feelings on purpose. Those people you want to put outside the hedge. Right. The people that hurt you on purpose, you are outside the hedge. Who are the people that you dearly love, you trust, and you're walking with, and really it needs to be for a lifetime? I walk with people for a lifetime. Pastor Kirsten, many on my staff, they, we all hold each other's shut-up card. And we try to be honorable and gracious in that. The number one shut-up card holder for me, clearly, is Pastor Karen. But I have others. I've walked with Dr. Morocco for... Well, I first came in the church in 92. That's a little while ago. Uh, that's 30 years ago. That's a while. He knows me. He not only knows me by the spirit, he knows my story. He knows my hurts. He knows my pains and all the things I've walked through. He knows me for 30 years. He knows me. He knows me. He knows where he knows what the things that affected me, things that have wounded me. He knows my victories. He, he knows me. Who are you committed to? And who's committed to you? who loves you enough, who's not afraid of hurting your feelings. Let's have a praise break because I'm not feeling the love. Let's go ahead. Hey, come on. Come on. Give a praise break. Ah, ah, help. Help me. So I don't want anybody to tell me. Well, what are you, you going to live on an island? It's not even God. Listen, we're supposed to serve God together. David sent away all of his accountability. He sent away the hedge of protection that comes from accountability and fellowship. And we should never do that. I think Joab would have gotten in his grill. The third hedge that he breaks is a hedge of prayer and worship. Where do you get that? The ark. You'll notice with uh, Uriah, who's so honorable, he doesn't even go back home. I'm going to tell you, I don't know what military man would come back from the war and like not go home. He doesn't go home because he's like, I shouldn't even be here. I should be with my men. I remember a number of years ago talking with uh, Sergeant Bobby Edwards, who was making a very hard decision. By the way, Bo Bobby Edwards is in full-time ministry in, in, a, in a ministry called For His Glory Outdoors, and God is using him to heal vets and using him in an amazing way and his wife, and God's just blessed him. It's just awesome, and, uh, and we celebrate. When he came here, he's, he was active in the military, and he was going to deploy and he had a choice to make some changes, and the Lord spoke to him to make the change. And I'll never forget when he was doing it, the biggest thing for him, tears running down his face, he says to me, those are my boys, man. They're going to go without me. They're going to deploy without me. I can't do that. I said, you're going to do what God tells you to do. I know. He prayed, and he prayed. He struggled with it. He was so committed to his, his battalion, so committed. They had been through a lot. And it was hard for him to make the choice to then become a drill instructor, which is what he did. And his battalion went overseas. And he was really tormented. And I thought, man, I wish more Christians would be like that. I wish more believers would be so committed to each other that they would stand arm in arm. Really, the picture of warfare in the book of Ephesians is the picture of Roman warfare where they knew each other. They served God. They served God. They, they, they served together. I think they served God together. Some of them were saved. Some history about that. But they served together since they were in their youth. They knew how one guy threw a spear or went what you know, certain injuries maybe they had had. And they knew how to compensate. They worked as a team. The strength of the Roman army 
was not in the individual champions. The strength of the Roman army was they worked as one man. The strength of the church is not an individual champions. It's working together arm in arm, locked in covenant relationship. That if you mess with my brother, you're going to have to mess with me. You better stop reading. I'm going to choke you out. I love that. That was a great story. I've never heard that. <laughs> David, he broke the hedge of protection by staying in the covenant plan and purpose of God going into battle. He didn't go to battle. Two, he sent off his closest relationships when he told him to shut up. Be quiet. Sorry. And the third thing is the ark is in the field. The ark is out at war. Where is the David who is like one thing that I will seek after to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple? What happened to him? He backslid. So this David that he couldn't sleep, if you read the Psalms, he wrote most of the Psalms. There's 50 Psalms that we don't know who wrote, but most of the Psalms are written by David, some by Solomon, one by Moses, some by the sons of Korah, some by the sons of Asaph, just took the test. So he wrote those Psalms. You read Psalms about him. He's like, man, he can't sleep. I can't let sleep go to my, he so wants to go to church. He so wants to be in the presence of God that he can't sleep. I mean, do, are you like that? It's amazing. What happened? That now the ark, the very visible, tangible, manifest presence of God between the cherubim of the ark is sent out into battle and David's content with sitting, sitting at home, lying in bed, watching Netflix and chill. Did I say that? Yeah. What happened? There is a protection that comes from being in God's presence. And the other thing that happens is the priest went to war too. So his whole prayer covering is gone. Who's your prayer covering? I just told you, I want you to pray for me. I'm saying it again. I want you to pray for Mayor Edna and Noel. I want you to pray for him every day. Every day? Yes, every day. When you're done praying for her, add me to the list, would you? I need a lot of help also. <laughs> Prayer brings a covering and protection, and those who are interceding for him, those who are interceding for him are gone. They're now in battle, and he's out from under the presence of God. He's out from under the prayer covering, and he no longer has a prayer life himself. That's really a threefold hedge. It's the hedge of God's presence and God's prayer your prayer, and those praying for you. I want you to be praying for my staff. I want you to be praying for this church. I want you to be praying every day, every day. Is everything good? It's better than good. It's on fire. It's amazing. You know why? Because we pray. And the moment we stop praying, which will never come, we're in big trouble. For the longest time, I was mandated by Dr. Morocco that I had to have a prayer meeting. And I, I understood prayer a little bit but I'd like, you know, my understanding was sometimes fade around 5 a.m. We had prayer at 5.30, 5.30 to 6.30 for years. 5 a.m. would go off and I'd be like, oh, God, Lord, let Pastor Kirsten do it. You know, you can't delegate your prayer life. I, I, you delegate a lot of things. You can't delegate your own personal prayer life. You can have people praying for you, but there's no substitute of you praying. There's no substitute for you coming. Come on into the presence of God. There's no substitute for you worshiping and lifting your hands. There's no substitute to that. You need God's presence. You need God's power. You need prayer protection. And David sent off his whole protection. He sent off the glory of Israel. He sent off the ark. He sent off the presence of God. Sent off his intercessors. No more intercessors. Raise your hand if you're intercessors. Good. You don't you need to think about it. You, your hand will shoot right up if you know you are one. And really, we're all called to be one. Thank you. Let me say thank you. It is a key to the victory that we're walking in and we will stay in that place if you've prayed. David sent them all off. You getting something tonight? No, yeah. oh, this other one. Personal holiness. There is no substitute for living holy. My daughter, uh, my daughter was telling me that she was at a church a while back. 
and the pastor was talking about his Instagram. I have Instagram. I'm on, I'm on Instagram. He's talking about his Instagram account. And he was saying, man, you got to watch out because you can really get defiled on Instagram. How many of you know that's true? I love what Dr. Janelle Morocco said years ago, visiting my house, talking to my son, Daniel. She says to him, so when you get defiled on your phone, what are you going to do about it? See, because we live in a world where defilement seems to break through. But what are you going to do when it happens? It's the question. Have you been defiled lately? Uh, nothing major. No. Something happened. I told my wife she prayed for me, but honestly, I can't remember what it is. I got no image, nothing coming to mind. And I don't go places on my phone that I, that I don't go places I shouldn't go. My daughter has become TikTok famous and with body dysmorphia, a niche thing in, uh, in TikTok. That's all I'll say about that. I went to follow her because it's my daughter, you know. The only problem is started following her and got sucked into a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm like, ah, ah. I, I'm off TikTok. Again, I don't know. It's like, what the heck? There's algorithms, yeah. right? So this pastor's talking about his Instagram and he was saying, you know, I was on my Instagram and I was on a search and I was searching, I was searching for stuff and there's so much, so many naked things and horrible things on there. Man, they just try to get you. I got news for you. You know what's horrible about that? You know what's really horrible about that? The only way that that stuff gets in your search is somebody's actually already been looking at it. It is the only way. If you looked at you, some of you are like locking your phones, kids are stuffing them in their back pockets. Listen, listen, if you look at somebody's search on their Instagram, does anybody know what I'm talking about? And if you're, if you're, not, if you're not tracking, it's okay. You look at somebody's search on their Instagram and you see a bunch of defiling pictures, guess what they're looking at? It's an algorithm that, that tries to get you to look at more of that. I was so blessed that I was with my daughter and hearing about it. She said, Dad, let me have your phone. I, I just went, I just handed her my phone. She, she opens it up. She goes to my Instagram and she starts laughing. She's like, that's like, so you. Got fast cars, motorcycles. You got sporting stuff on there. You got some weightlifting on there, food stuff on there. There's no defiling things on my search. Don't look now, because everybody's going to know you. You're talking to your, you're talking to your husband, you're talking to your wife. Give, give me your phone. Give me your phone. Personal holiness. Personal holiness brings protection that nothing else can. I'm never going to be accused of, of, of anything like, oh, he, I was giving me a ride in his car, and then pastor put his hand. No, that's not going to happen. You know why? You ain't getting my car. Why's that? Because there's only one woman that gets in my car and her name is Pastor Karen. And if there's another one, it's uh, my princess, Hannah. And, and it's not that I wouldn't drive with other ladies, maybe friends of my wife and such, but it's not going to be me and some college student in my car. Why? Because you could never, well, how would that be? We shared this story a while back. The first one that's funny is I made a deal with my wife. I'm not riding with another woman in a car ever. In fact, in elevators, elevators now, when, I, when I'm on an elevator and it opens up and there's a lady who goes to get on, I get off. I don't care what floor it is, I'm stepping off. Why? Because, man, I got hedges of protection and I'm not violating. I won't violate. It. And it can be a little over the top. And honestly, you know, if grandma gets on, I'm like, you know, God bless you. And I stay on. I'm just saying there's certain times where I don't always do that, but mostly. I was going to a funeral and I had no car and Pastor Ann was there and Pastor Ann was going to drive me to the funeral. So we go to get in the car. Some of you heard this story before. I'm newly married about a year. I go to get in the car and I'm like, oh, this is a commitment I made to my wife. Ah. So she's getting and she says, get in the car. I said, yeah, Pastor Ann, I made a covenant with my wife that I'm, I can't ride with. She says, get in the car. I was like, yes, Pastor Ann. Come on, lift your hands to Jesus. How's your personal holiness? Set your life up. 
Set your life up. Have standards, don't violate them. Have principles, have integrity. Why? Because you don't want to be benched. Shoot, you could miss heaven altogether. I said, you could miss heaven altogether. You could abort the plan that God has for you. You know, all it takes is an accusation. All it takes is one person. We know this in children's ministry. We don't do, we have two unrelated people that take, take kids to the bathroom. There's a whole system in place. Why? Because we don't ever want to put a kid at risk. Not that our people are unworthy, they're worthy, but we never want them even to be accused. And sometimes there's a thing called transference. Not sometimes, many times. There's the psychological principle of transference. Where if a child has gone through something and some abuse, they need to get it out. And when they find somebody that maybe remotely looks like the person that did it, then they just, they got to get it out. And, and maybe it costs too much to point to dad, okay? Or point, point, costs too much to point to mom. Or maybe there's something that would hinder them from telling the truth and they're afraid. So they say, well, he, he, he did it. And in their minds, actually, they believe it's true. And they'd pass a test. But in actual fact, that's not, the, you know why that'll never happen to any of our children's workers? And it'll never happen to me. And it's never going to happen to you in Jesus' name. You know why? Because I'm not going to put myself in a position where I could even ever be accused. Is your daughter here? Is Ivanka here? Can, 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 can she help me for a second? Here, come here, sweetheart, if you're... Oh, no. Nope, no deal. What I was going to illustrate is that when I pick up babies, you'll, you'll see me do it. I pick up, I'll say hi to children. When I pick them up, I pick them up like this. Their legs are going this way. I'll, I'll let my kid ride on my hip. I don't put other kids on my hip like that. Why? It's not my kid. I've seen stuff. Listen, you watch your, I am on something right now, man. I can feel it. I can feel it in the Holy Ghost. If you don't know how to build hedges of protection for your children, man, am I going to say this again, Pastor? We don't have sleepovers at my house. First of all, all my kids are older now. We just generally don't have sleepovers. Why? It's way too much liability. Way too much. What do you mean? It's dangerous. And I certainly never sent my kids. Can we go sleep? They don't even, they stopped asking. They stopped asking. How come all the other kids get to go over and sleep over their house? I don't know, but you're not allowed. How come? Because I said so. Oh, okay. Because I've just counseled too many people. I've, I've seen too much. Seen too much. Too much counseling where they went over someone's house. Oh, uncle, he's a holy man of the cloth. Yeah, uncle. And his friend comes over who's not such a holy man. And in the middle of the night, and I'm not even going to say anything else. I'm just telling you, if you don't know what's going on and you're not in control of that environment, then that, that, that's scary. The hedge of protection that comes from personal holiness, you guard over your kids. Listen to me. You pick your kids' friends. Are you hearing me right now? Let's say, I'm taking my jacket off. You pick your kids' friends based on what? Righteousness, purity, holiness, the family. Well, that's kind of judgmental. Yeah. Judgment, actually. It's, it's understanding where your kids are going. If you don't know where they are at night, you don't know what they're doing in the middle of the night, you don't know what's on their phone, you don't know who they're ga gaming. Should we go there? You know, people meet. I, oh, my gosh. What time is it? Jesus, help us. Come on, let's ask for God's help. Oh, help. Help. Grow some hedges. Yeah. Number one, what's the first hedge? I'll tell you the gaming story in a second. What's the first hedge? Stay in the battle. Blah, blah, blah. Stay in the battle. What's the second hedge? <laughs> Who's got your shut up card? Fellowship, accountability. Who holds your shut up card? Third point, third hedge. Prayer, the presence of God. Your prayer life, people praying for you, being in the... Listen, going to church, it's not some optional thing. 
In this day and age, you get to be filled with God, develop relationships in the house, serve God with all your heart. He said, well, I just don't feel like going. You're on the way to a backslide. Now, I know you can be skiing or you can be doing this different thing, but it's a covenant relationship with God to serve Him, to come to church, da church daily. Sure. Have church, walk with Him daily. Come to church, serve God, be a part of it. Amen. Number four. Sorry, can't hear you. All right, one more time. Personal holiness. I have known people that have been a part of our church in times gone by while on games meet people and, and, and on the internet. It's so grievous to me. They meet people on the internet and they're talking and, and they decide, you know, we really like each other. And, you know, the pool's a little shallow in, in Alaska. I can't find anybody. And we just connected on the internet and, and we've been going back and forth. Now, my next question is this. Here's my next question. And this happened dozens, dozens, that's exaggerating, but a, do, a dozen times. I said, they ask you for money? Oh, yeah. They, they need a little bit of help. They were in, uh huh. I want to tell you that you're probably texting and talking to a 700 pound man sitting behind a desk who's just ripping you off. And her name is, I don't know, Janice. If your name is Janice, don't be offended. My point is, you don't know what's going on. I said, you don't know what's going on. Don't do that. Don't, don't develop cyber relationships. I have seen it work. I have seen it work. There's certain dating sites that can work, but it's very, I'm very leery and you have to, you have to have someone helping you to do that. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't, uh, all right, you're single. I, I, I have seen it work. We've got some very close friends and met somebody through a Christian dating site and they, they, they planned it out and eventually they met and, and it was righteous and they're still married and they have a beautiful life and just doing great things for God. I think it can work, but you need to be very leery, be very careful. Holiness, four hedges, first hedge, you gotta grow them. They don't, you can come to the altar, we'll pray for you. You have to grow this yourself. You don't just get it like poof. Healing, healing is a children's bread. It's a covenant right. Healing, by his stripes you are, we are healed, right. So healing is by faith you receive that. These hedges, you gotta do it. You gotta grow it. You gotta make it happen. Number one, personal, the hedge of what? Staying in the battle, staying at cutting edge of faith, obeying God, being where you need to be. Hedge number two. Hedge number two. Fellowship and accountability. Fellowship and accountability. Everybody say fellowship and accountability. Fellowship and accountability. Hedge number three. Prayer. You can always tell you go up to somebody, you're going to give them the mic, and they're like, start looking around, and you know, I didn't, I didn't fill in the notes. Maybe you did, I don't know. Prayer. Presence being prayed for. Hedge of protection number four. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life, and I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065 We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.